So when do we start treatment? Um, you know, I think much like we talked about with follicular lymphoma, it's important to recognize that um, there is no overall survival advantage to treating patients in the absence of symptomatic CLL. So patients often will come, they will often, I, I think, will anticipate that they may require treatment, and I think that can sometimes be a relatively difficult thing for patients to understand, but I think it's important to recognize that at least until this um, point in time, we don't have any information that suggests that patients who don't need treatment benefit from getting treatment in terms of their long-term outcome. So I think as most of you know well, the criteria that are typically used for considering initiation of treatment in patients with CLL are the IWCLL criteria, which are listed here. Um, so patients with really symptomatic or bulky lymph nodes, that would be considered more than 10 centimeters. A symptomatic or enlarging spleen, so more than six centimeters below the costal margin. Cytopenias that are really due to the CLL involvement in the bone marrow, like hemoglobin less than 11, but it's created less than uh, 100,000 or constitutional symptoms due to disease. And these are really symptoms that are, are, are life-changing symptoms, change symptoms that really impact a patient's day-to-day quality of life. I think one, uh, one area uh, to point out is that many of our patients with CLL will uh, sometimes present with autoimmune cytopenias. Depending on whether they have other factors for initiation of treatment, the autoimmune cytopenias don't necessarily uh, indicate that they need CLL treatment. You can often manage those cytopenias with immunosuppression, but patients who do not respond to immunosuppression should be treated for their CLL. And so patients who have poorly controlled autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP, often that's an indication for treatment as well. And then this last category here, I think, is an, um, is an important one to think about and is often considered in the context of clinical trials. We do recognize that there is some important prognostic information that comes from looking at the lymphocyte doubling time. So for a patient who has an absolute lymphocyte count that's greater than 30,000, if you look at that doubling time, patients who have an increase in that lymphocyte count uh, that uh, doubles in uh, less than six months, generally that is a predictor of a patient that is going to require treatment. So these, um, by and large, are, still remain our criteria for initiation of, of treatment in CLL. Um, so where do we start with treatment? So I put this up here because I think um, you know many people might look to the NCCN guidelines look helpful. When I look at this slide, I think I don't know where to begin. There's a lot of information there, um, but I think you know generally speaking, we can sort of think about how to categorize the different profiles of patients that we see, and really think about that that risk information that that is can be obtained at diagnosis and really should be. Um, to help us think about this, as well as the age and the comorbidities of the patient. Again, in a disease that is largely incurable, we really need to think about the balance of efficacy of treatment versus the toxicities that we're using. Um, so this is kind of how I think about CLL, and I think many of my colleagues um, do as well. And that's really to think first and foremost, I think about patients that are young, and young in CLL consider less than 65 years of age, relatively fit. This means that really all of the treatment options that that have some proven benefit may be available to them. And importantly, these are patients who do not have 17P deletions. So we'll talk specifically about 17P deleted patients shortly. The next category I think about are patients that are slightly older. Perhaps these are patients with more comorbidities. They don't have to be older. They may just have more comorbidities. And again, no 17P deletion. And then the last group, really, this, the deletion 17P patients are a group of patients that we know do relatively poorly with chemoimmunotherapy. And um, uh, we have, a, a, I think, a, a fairly uh, consensus first uh, treatment for them. So I'll talk about each of these categories shortly, but just to review what they are. For younger fit patients, that may include chemoimmunotherapy. It may include a BTK inhibitor such as ibrutinib. For older patients who um, have more comorbidities, again, BTK inhibitor or uh, an older treatment, chlorambucil paired with a novel anti-CD20 antibody. And then the last point to make is that I think for all of these patient groups and the disease we don't cure, it's still very important to consider clinical trials. So there is a lot of exciting work going on, some of which I'll, I'll have the opportunity to highlight for you today, um, that suggests that there really is a role for clinical trial for all of these groups of patients. So to talk about standard treatment in a, in a young or fit patient that doesn't have a 17D, uh, 17B deletion, um, I think many of you are familiar with the use of um, alkylating agents uh, such as, or in combination with anti-CD20 antibodies such as FCR or ER. 
Um, I'll talk about data for frontline use of ivermectin as well. And I think what's important here is to really think about what is our goal of therapy? What is the depth of response versus the toxicity? In a fit patient population, I, I think we still have to ask this question, right? There are differences in the way these treatments are, del are delivered, uh, namely that these two treatments are often given for a fixed interval. This treatment is a continuous interval, so that's an important consideration when we're thinking about how to sequence our therapies. Um, the first slide I'll show you, these are, uh, are data that I think are well known to many, many folks. These are from uh, data from Bill Weirder at MD Anderson that shows in a phase two study of FCR, this is the initial study of FCR done at MD Anderson, uh, that there is, uh, that there appears to be a tail on the curve of the progression-free survival for patients who are treated with FCR. So what does this mean? Well, when we look at this population of uh, patients treated with FCR and MD Anderson further, what you can see is that for the patients who have IGHV mutated, so this is the favorable group of patients, so it really does appear to be a plateau to this progression-free survival curve at 10 years or longer, suggesting that some of these patients may actually be cured uh, by FCR. Now, we don't know that, and we need to follow these curves continuously, but that is an exciting finding to see that for frontline uh, treatment, that there may be a group of patients that are long-term uh, non-progressors. Um, importantly, when we use FCR, as many of you have familiarity, um, it is it can be a toxic therapy, so the rate of grade three, four neutropenias is high. Um, Fludarabine is quite lymphodepleting, and there is, as Dr. Ivani pointed out previously, an increased risk of secondary malignancies. It is important to think about um, what that means for patients' overall survival. Um, showing you uh, some similar data, but in comparison to VR, this is from the German CLL10 study. So this is a, a large phase three study that was conducted in Europe, in which patients were randomized to receive uh, FCR for six cycles or BR. These are again untreated patients uh, with CLL who required an indication for treatment. There were not any patients who had 17P deletions in this uh, uh, patient population. And here are the progression free survival curves from the CLL10 uh, trial. And what you can see is that the progression free survival favored the use of BR uh, by about 14 months, or favored the use of FCR, excuse me, by about 14 months or so. But importantly, and I don't have the overall survival curve here, there was no statistically significant difference in overall survival. So while there's a difference in progression-free survival for FCR, there is no overall survival benefit associated with the use of FCR. Um, toxicities overall, grade three and four toxicities were quite different between the two groups, with the VR being generally less toxic. So I think, um, again, what these data show is that while there is a progression-free survival benefit with FCR, and while we recognize that some patients may have uh, long-term uh, non-relapse uh, with FCR that we have to think about toxicities. What about if you look at the mutation status in this data set? Well, again, you'll actually see the same thing. For the patients who have IGHV mutated status and receive FCR, again, uh, out beyond five years or four years, there's a plateau to this curve. Importantly, if you look at the counterparts, the IGHV mutant treated with BR, there is no plateau to that curve. So what do, how do we put these together? Well, again, I think if you have a fit patient that's young and requires treatment and you're thinking about chemoimmunotherapy, I think it's very important for us to know what their IGHV mutation status is because that may push you towards consideration of FCR in the right patient because of that possibility of long-term non-progression. I think that if you are going to use chemoimmunotherapy, it's very important to know what the IGHV status is for that patient because it really can make a difference in outcome. What about uh, non-chemotherapy approaches in the frontline setting? Um, so I'll outline for you that often we think about this in older patients, and I'll talk about the experience of using a BTK inhibitor, specifically ibrutinib. Just to remind you all um, that the, uh, ibrutinib is a, a, a covalent binding, BT, uh, irreversible inhibitor of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, so BTK is a uh, protein uh, tyrosine kinase that is in uh, downstream of the B-cell receptor pathway. We know this pathway is very important for the maintenance of uh, CLL clones, and specifically ibrutinib is the, um, the first uh, approved uh, BTK inhibitor for use in CLL. It um, has significant efficacy in frontline as well as relapse refractory CLL. To talk a little bit about the frontline data, these are um, this is uh, the Resonate 2 trial. So this is an international randomized phase three trial of ibrutinib versus chlorambucil alone in older patients. So these are patients older than uh, 65 who had never had prior treatment for their CLL. 
Uh, again, patients with deletion 17P were excluded from this study. And uh, patients who were uh, in need of an anticoagulant, specifically warfarin, were excluded. And we'll talk a little bit about why that may be, as many of you are familiar uh, with the fact that ibrutinib does have um, some increased risk of bleeding. So in the study, patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to ibrutinib 420 milligrams daily, which they took as a continuous medication until progressive disease or toxicity that required them to stop a medicine versus chloramicil, which was given for up to 12 cycles. The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival, the secondary endpoints were overall survival and hematological improvement. There was a crossover design in this study so that uh, in the chloramicil arm, about 43 patients did crossover to be treated with the ibrutinib. So here are the PFS curves from the study, and I don't think there's any surprises here. You can see that overall the progression-free survival was markedly improved for patients on ibrutinib uh, compared to single-agent chloramicil, with an 88% reduction in the risk of progression or death. Um, here are the overall survival curves. So there was an overall survival benefit for patients treated with ibrutinib, keeping in mind that this even included patients that had crossed over from chloramicil to receive ibrutinib. What about the response when you look across the risk groups? So um, when you look across uh, categories of risk for the CLL patients, first of all, you can see that the overall response rate was high in all patients, 92%, with a minority of responses being complete responses, the majority really are partial responses. And when you look at the high-risk group of patients with deletion 11Q, you can see the overall response was 100%. Um, actually uh, similar if not improved over without deletion 11Q and if you look at the IGHV unmutated patients compared to the mutated patients again very high response rates with about roughly speaking about 20% CR rate across the board so really uh, the benefit seems to be across all risk groups. With long-term follow-up data from the Resonate 2 trial as well as other ibrutinib studies we know that uh, the depth of response continues with time. So overall, when you look at the rate of CR, at 12 months it's 7%, at, 50, at 24 months it's 15%, and a longer median fall is 18%. So patients who are responding to the ibrutinib can continue to have an improvement in the depth of their response. Um, I, I really like um, this slide in particular because this is a representation not from the clinical trial but from real world registry data. So these are Anthony Mato's data as well as uh, those from other centers that contribute. I think there were uh, nine centers around the country that contributed data to this data set. And what we're looking at is the use of ibrutinib in a real world population. So these are patients that have received commercial ibrutinib. And at about 80 uh, patients in, a, uh, in the data set from about 600 total treated with ibrutinib were receiving ibrutinib as a frontline treatment. And what you can see here is the overall survival is very, very good. Um, eight, no, very few patients in this, uh, in this registry have died from, pro uh, from uh, progressive disease. Um, but importantly, about 15% of the patients out of this 80 did require dose adjustments. So there are toxicities associated with the medicine that need to be managed. And about a quarter of patients actually require discontinuation. Again, most of those patients discontinue due to toxicity, with a minority uh, discontinuing due to CLL progression. So what are some of those toxicities? So I've highlighted for you some of the common toxicities here, cytopenias, um, uh, diarrhea, that's an important one. That one can sometimes be modified by when patients take the medication. I think early on in the use of ibrutinib, fatigue and arthralgias tend to be more common. These tend to go away with time. Um, similarly for rash. But I think the ones that I've highlighted here in black are the ones that we all think about. And so these are adverse events that may not be the most frequent, but really can be very severe or, or, or serious adverse events. And so um, hypertension is an important one. Uh, many of our patients are older. It's important to make sure that we're following their blood pressure and managing that well. About 10% um, or so of more patients will require uh, additional treatment for their hypertension. Atrial fibrillation. I think this one's important and probably gets a, a lot of our attention. Uh, overall, the rate of atrial fibrillation is probably somewhere between 5 and 15%, uh, depending on which data sets you're looking at. Most of the time, this can be well managed, but occasionally patients do need to come off the drug due to atrial fibrillation that can't be well managed. And I think bleeding is a particularly important side effect. We know that, that BTK inhibitors may, as a class, have a bleeding uh, and increased risk of bleeding. We don't quite yet know what all of the, the mechanism behind that is, 
but it's important to recognize that patients on BTK inhibitors, and especially those on other medications that may increase their risk of bleed, uh, bleeding, be monitored closely for bleeding, as well as for um, uh, management of these drugs around the time of important procedures or surgeries that require, that have a, a high bleeding risk. And then the last I put here as a adverse event is one that we sometimes don't think about as much as we should, which is cost, right? So this is an oral drug where often patients are paying the burden of, of that treatment, very different from the IV treatments where um, how, how their insurance handles that is very different. So sometimes with an indefinite therapy like this, albeit a very good therapy, um, that cost over time to the patients is really substantial. And so that's an important consideration as well. Um, so what about our future directions for treatment of frontline CLL? Where are we going? What's exciting? So I'll share with you some data that was presented this year, but I think a lot of um, people uh, are very excited about novel novel drug combinations, specifically BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors. Um, also some data um, from Europe uh, in this German CLL14 study of uh, BCL2 inhibitor of adenoclax with novel anti-CD20 antibodies, so I really think that my view, this is likely where we're going. Most patients in the front line will uh, likely be treated with novel novel drug combinations as those data mature. Um, importantly, we, we touched on the fact that some patients, especially those young fit patients who are IGHV mutated, uh, can have significant long-term benefit from chemoimmunotherapy, and there are a number of uh, trials looking to combine BTK inhibitors as well as BF3 kinase inhibitors with the backbone of FCR. And so we look forward to those data as well. And then the last is to really think about this question. Do we have therapies that we can give for a fixed duration of treatment? Right now our targeted therapies are often given indefinitely, but as we explore the combinations and see what the, the depth of response is, can we think about fixed duration therapy for our patients? So I'll share with you some of the data that uh, was presented at ASCO. These are uh, Bill Weirder's data from a, a, a phase two study called Captivate. And this is a study of uh, frontline ibrutinib plus venetoclax in patients that had never had prior treatment for their CLL. Um, all patients required an indication for treatment for the IWCLL criteria. Importantly, these were younger patients with good performance status. And the design of the study was that all patients on the study would get three months of single agent ibrutinib. The idea there was to try to debulk the patients of their disease and then would go on to receive the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax for up to 12 cycles. The venetoclax was ramped up uh, after the initial uh, lead-in with the ibrutinib. Um, there's a randomization.